winners of the paper prize and the poster prize from the uh, Children and Young People's Mental Health Early Career Research event that we ran end of uh, last month. It was a really vibrant event where we heard from uh, many different uh, early career researchers uh, at different stages of their career doing research using multiple methods, looking at different research questions. And it was it was extremely um, uh, sort of encouraging and heartening to see all the absolutely fabulous work that was going on at UCL in this area and we'll be um, sure to organize more of these events in the future. Uh, two papers were selected for the Early Career um, uh, Research Paper Prizes. Uh, the first one was by Dr. Jean Wollstencroft, uh, who's research fellow at UCL Great Ormond Street Institute of Child Health, and her paper, which was published in Lancet Psychiatry, uh, was titled Neuropsychiatric Risk in Children with Intellectual Disability of Genetic Origin, Imagine a UK National Cohort Study. And uh, the second uh, paper to win a paper prize was by Merle Schlieff and Theodora Stefanido. Uh, um, and uh, they are welcome trusted funded PhD student in clinical mental health sciences and research fellow in division of uh, psychiatry. They joined first authors of the paper, which was published in Nature Human Behavior um, and uh, provided a rapid realist review of universal interventions to promote include and acceptance of diverse sexual and gender identities in schools. And these were both uh, extremely uh, impressive papers addressing really, really uh, important topics. So congratulations um, to all the paper prize winners. We also awarded uh, poster prizes, uh, one of which was an academic poster prize chosen by uh, senior academics. And the other one uh, was Young People Advisory Group poster prize chosen by uh, uh, young people advisors in, in children and young people's mental health. And these prizes uh, went to uh, Sarah Stock and Mariam Javed. Um, congratulations to both of them uh, as well. And I'm going to hand over to Peter now. And thank you so much. Uh, I see that's really very kind, but it is my enormous pleasure to introduce two of the perhaps brightest shining stars in our developmental psychopathology horizon at University College London. Um, professor Essie Widding, who is a uh, professor of developmental psychopathology in the well. Division of uh, Psychology and Language Sciences, who also chairs the uh, UCL's uh, Children and Young People's Mental Health Research Strategy Implementation, and co-directs and has co-directed uh, for some years the highly successful um, developmental risk and resilience unit and also holds adjunct faculty position at Yale University Child Study Center. She is a fellow of the British Academy, uh, the Academy of Medical Sciences has received uh, numerous awards including the Royal Society uh, Rosalind Franklin Award. Um, uh, Essie is past president of the Society, the Society Study of Psychopathy, and is eminently qualified to talk to us uh, this lunchtime on disruptive behavior disorder. But so is uh, Professor Ajiri Stingaris, and uh, he is a, a clinician and a neuroscientist uh, studying mood and anxiety, was appointed chair of child and adolescent psychiatry at UCL in January uh, last year. Until then, he held the influential and important position of being senior investigator and chief of the section of clinical computational psychiatry at NIMH, NIH in Washington. He is a recipient of uh, the Outstanding Mentor Award at the, of the National Institute of Mental Health. And this was whilst he was a uh, senior lecturer and welcome uh, trust fellow at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience. But also in NIH in 2009, he won the uh, Director Award. Uh, he is uh, this year amongst the world's highly cited researchers, 
uh, and uh, is the president of the International Strategy for Research in Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Two incredible scientists. And uh, I think we are really in for a treat to hear about disruptive behavior disorders. Uh, and the subtitle is a meaningful one. The poor cousin of children and young people's mental health research. So here we are hearing the case being made for those young people uh, with uh, disruptive disorders. Essie, Algeris, over to you. Thanks, Peter, very much for your generous words. You. Um, we will now demonstrate how um, we are both uh, too old to make really cool slides, <laughs> but they will hopefully uh, uh, make a point. So given that number of the considerations um, around yes. disruptive behaviors are common to um, different subtypes of uh, disruptive behavior disorders. We chose to do a joint talk because a number of sort of conclusions and research directions that we want to talk about really apply to whether you look at uh, subgroups of individuals who have callous and emotional traits, which is what I will talk about, or those uh, who have a more irritable presentation, which is what Arguris will talk about. I'm very sorry to interrupt. I said just wanted to to flag that we can see the presenter view. Oh, so you, see you, wish you will switch. switch. To Perfect. There Excellent. we are. Looks better? Good. Beautiful. Thank you. Thanks. So as most of you uh, probably know, disruptive behavior disorders refer to oppositional defiant disorder and conduct disorder. Uh, both of these refer to uh, violation of societal norms of behavior and violations of rights of others that are age atypical. So we know that all children will have tantrums every now and again, all children will behave badly every now and again. However, the extent and frequency uh, with which that happens in children with oppositional defiant disorder and conduct disorder is atypical to their, um, their same age peers. So those with oppositional defiant disorder often have temper tantrums. They seem to be easily annoyed by others, argue a lot, always question rules can do things to deliberately annoy and upset others, often have a very sort of angry outlook and attitude and can seek revenge or be vindictive. Um, those with conduct disorder display more serious forms of antisocial behavior. So they often bully, engage in physical fights. They can be cruel to others or animals. They can use a weapon, um, force someone into sexual activity and, and inten intentionally destroy other people's property. Um, and they also engage in lying theft uh, and truancy. Now, uh, these sorts of uh, uh, disorders have lifelong consequences. Um, so they have consequences to physical health. Um, uh, those individuals with early onset disruptive behavior disorders are in poorer physical health uh, as adults than their uh, uh, peers. Uh, they have uh, mental health problems, not just those related to antisocial behavior disorders, but also those uh, related uh, you know, to other constellations of mental health problems. They have relationship difficulties. They often have difficulty in uh, holding on to employment or finishing education. So the impact on the individual, but also society in terms of uh, financial losses and, and impacts uh, on a kind of a more personal level are quite substantial. The estimated population prevalence of disruptive behavior disorders is pro approximately 5 to 10 percent, depending on uh, how you slice the pie, what your sample is. By the age of 18, uh, those who have early onset disruptive behavior disorders have typically cost the society 10 times the amount that their peers. And overall, persistent antisocial behavior costs UK economy 60 billion pounds a year. So this is really a problem that has enormous financial impact on society. Yet we have traditionally had a real lack of parity in research funding uh, to disruptive behavior disorders compared to uh, other mental health disorders. And this is all in the context of the fact that uh, we already see very low spending on mental health disorders in general compared to many physical health uh, conditions. So just nine pounds a year is spent on research per year. That, uh, that was in 2017, maybe a little bit more now, but not substantially more uh, for each person affected by mental illness. And this is a fraction of what we, uh, what we see um, spent on things like cancer or cardiovascular disease, for instance. 
and public also doesn't donate the same extent to mental health. And then of this very, very small uh, slice of the pie, the disruptive behavior disorders get about 2.4%. And perhaps given this context, it's not so surprising that we've seen relatively little progress in improving the efficacy of interventions, uh, which we know currently don't work for all children and young people with disruptive behavior disorders. So we would argue that we need to better understand the dynamic interplay between various intra and inter-individual factors over development, and we need to bring different methodologies and research traditions together if we really want to understand how disruptive behaviors develop. And we often talk about this as uh, studying the embedded brain, so really trying to understand what are the individual factors that influence how these children see the world, how they respond to others, how they behave, uh, what sort of conditions they generate in the social world around them, and how they process the social inputs that they receive over, over time. So rather than trying to focus on, okay, there's something wrong with this child's brain, or there's something wrong with this child's social environment, I think if we want to progress uh, this area of research, we really need to try and bring the two effectively together to try and understand how they shape each other over time. So the developmental framework is really key here as well. Now, like for any other disorders, we uh, diagnose based on behaviors. But individuals who have disruptive behavior disorders form a heterogeneous population. So they don't all have identical presentation. They don't all have identical set of risk factors. And this really behooves us to try and understand different developmental pathways to disruptive uh, behavior disorders if we want to target prevention and interventions in ways that really respond to needs of particular children in particular circumstances. So this is a phenomenon that in uh, developmental psychopathology is called equifinality. Uh, so the idea that uh, under the same diagnostic criteria, you have individuals who've arrived there via a number of different causal pathways. I think in this context, we also need to um, think about multifinality. So we may see children with disruptive behavior disorders at a particular time point, but they may actually develop uh, into some other kind of uh, mental health presentation later on. So this is the concept of multi-finality, uh, and it really, um, really uh, brings home the, uh, the sort of the notion of heterotypic continuity as well, which is what we see in developmental psychopathology all the time. So it's very rare that you see someone who is diagnosed with one thing, and then that is how they develop for the rest of their lives. Individuals remit, or they may develop other symptomatology, either in a comorbid way, or by their presentation changing in a way that means that they are at a later time point uh, receiving a different kind of uh, diagnosis. And in this talk, uh, we will consider both callous and emotional traits and irritability and highlight how may, they may sort of impact how uh, disruptive behavior disorders present and how they may canalize our development <clears throat> and how they may both impact uh, socialization um, and, um, and also how we might want to think about treating disruptive behavior disorders. So I will first uh, cover a little bit of um, research in the callous and emotional traits, both research that I have been leading, but also research by other people. And then I will hand over to Arguris to talk about irritability and also to draw some uh, conclusions and future ways uh, forward. So callous and emotional uh, traits and irritability are not uh, fully independent constructs in the sense that, you know, you see some uh, individuals who can present with both. So they don't, or maybe I should say they're not fully mutually exclusive constructs. Um, uh, but despite some overlap, uh, there are clearly very distinct features and uh, there are many children who just present with one or the other. Uh, callous and emotional traits uh, refu uh, refer to reduced empathy. Uh, reduced remorse and guilt, and uh, increased capacity for manipulating others uh, and increased self-interest. So children and uh, young people who are characterized with these traits really have difficulty in feeling for other people, don't seem to feel guilt when they have done something uh, bad, and are often really just interested in what's good for them 
what they want, as opposed to being interested in what might be good for other people, what might be good for communal interest. These children are a, a smaller subset of children with disruptive behavior disorders. They often have fearless temperament in early childhood. Uh, they engage in both proactive, so this is planned, premeditated uh, aggression, and also reactive aggression. And their reactive aggression is often a result of being frustrated uh, because they didn't get what they want. They do not worry about hurting others, and as I've already said, they lack guilt. In contrast, those with uh, disruptive behavior disorders, but who have lower levels of callous and emotional traits, display predominantly reactive aggression, both frustration-based and also threat-reactive, and also are capable of feeling bad about hurting others, uh, although they might need some time to simmer down before, um, before they think about that. If we want to try and understand what might make those with high callous and emotional traits callous, uh, we may uh, focus on uh, how they process information, uh, what their brains look like, and also what the origins of their antisocial behavior may be. And there's now over 20 years of research using different experimental paradigms, looking at in particular affect processing in those with high callous and emotional traits. And this research has uh, demonstrated that these children have difficulties with recognizing and paying attention to other people's emotions. Uh, they also show attenuated psychophysiological responses, particularly to other people's distress, so fear and sometimes sadness. And they also report atypical own emotional experience. And that sort of ties in with this notion that they are often fearless uh, and they may not experience particular emotions in the same ways and others, both uh, negative and positive. And this has led ourselves and others to speculate that perhaps one of the reasons that these children find it so hard to empathize with other people is because they simply don't have the experience base of distress emotions or affiliative joy, for instance, um, which are so critical for the rest of us for connecting with other people and for caring about other people. They also have difficulties in reinforcement rate uh, learning. So they have difficulty making a connection between what they have done and then what the outcome uh, of that action is. Um, it would be very surprising if given this sort of profile, these children would look uh, entirely typical in how their brains process emotion. And uh, we conducted one of the earlier studies looking at uh, the neural responses to emotions, where we directly compared uh, groups of children who had disruptive behavior disorders and who had either low or high levels of callous and emotional traits. And we presented them with a very simple task where they were shown in either an emotional uh, fear face or a uh, calm face, uh, which was then backward masked immediately with a face of a different emotion. And uh, sorry, face of a neutral face of a different identity, sorry. And the reason uh, the emotion was presented for a very short time is that this is uh, below the time it takes for uh, eye to saccade. So the idea was that when we queued to the presentation, we could be relatively confident that everyone was getting the same visual input in this task. So we checked uh, afterwards that the children didn't report receiving any emotional faces. They just said they, they were seeing faces that uh, changed on the screen. Uh, so the emotion perception was implicit uh, in this case. Um, however, this task does uh, effectively engage the amygdala in uh, many people. And what we saw when we compared groups of children who had either high or low callous and emotional traits uh, to typically developing peers that were matched on um, IQ and socioeconomic status and handedness was that those with high levels of callous and emotional traits showed lower strictly degree of amygdala reactivity to this task. And those with low callous and emotional traits in fact, so it exaggerated degree of amygdala activity in this task. And the findings remained when we controlled for co-occurring psychopathology. Now, this was one of the earlier studies. So we had sample sizes that uh, couldn't get us published anymore. Uh, and if we only had this one study, we might not be so confident uh, of uh, the findings relating to a uh, high callus group. However, there have been a number of studies, only a fraction of which I'm displaying here, since uh, the publication of that paper that have all shown heterogeneity, heterogeneity of neural response to negative emotions in children with uh, disruptive behavior disorders. 
So this has been found using complex emotional scenes, attention to negative emotion and pain processing. And uh, the children who have high callous and emotional traits showed this pattern of attenuated neural response to distress and negative uh, affective stimuli. We have also recently got in, interested in their neural response to positive emotions. Um, and this is because we know that these children show atypical affiliation to other people. They don't seem to uh, have lasting friendships. They don't seem to be treating their family members in a consistently uh, loving way. So we wanted to probe their processing of uh, positive emotions by playing them sounds of laughter uh, inside the scanner. This was a collaboration with Sophie Scott's group uh, here at UCL. And we know that laughter is a universal nonverbal expression of uh, positive uh, um, emotion. It's there to maintain social bonds and affiliation. Uh, so we thought this was a very nice probe uh, for looking at positive emotion processing in these children. And here's a photo of my daughter many, many years ago uh, with Louis Arsenault, I think demonstrating quite nicely how laughing together connects us uh, with other people. So when we had the children listening to laughter uh, inside the scanner, we noted uh, two differences between those with high callous uh, unemotional traits and uh, match typically developing uh, children. Um, we saw differences in the supplementary motor area and also differences in the anterior insula. Uh, we did not see this degree of differences in the low callus group. They showed some difference from typicals in the supplementary motor area, but not in the anterior insula. Uh, which is really thought to be a, a, a sort of a key part of, uh, of the sort of resonating with other people's emotions. We also um, did a behavioral task outside the scanner and those with conduct problems and high CU traits um, reported that they don't feel like joining in with laughter as much as typically developing children. And anterior insular activity differences partly explained the differences in self-reported desire to join in in this group. However, we don't know, because we have cross-sectional data, whether these uh, neural patterns that we say, saw were cause or consequence of atypical affiliation. And my educated guess is that it's probably a bit of both. You know, we have um, development is a transactional process and uh, our information processing contributes to that, as does uh, the environmental inputs that as do the environmental inputs that we receive. And if you react atypically to a particular emotional um, stimuli, that will probably shape your social interactions over time. But you may also have parents who share some of the vulnerabilities who may provide atypical social inputs for children as well. And the challenge really is to try and understand um, how these sorts of transactional processes canalize over time. We've also tried to understand how uh, disruptive behaviors come about uh, in children with high callous and emotional traits and whether the etiological processes may be different from those uh, that we see in those with low callous and emotional traits. And to do this, uh, we've compared identical and uh, non-identical twins um, from the twins early development study. So this is a collaboration uh, with Robert Plomin. Um, and because he has a large twin sample, we have been able to focus on the uh, top 10% uh, for conduct problems. So that, were, that was our kids with the disruptive behavior disorders. And then we divided this group into two, depending on whether they also had uh, callous and emotional traits in the top 10%, or whether neither of the uh, member of the twin pair had callous and emotional traits in that um, high range. And what we've shown is that for the group with high callous and emotional traits, uh, their disruptive behaviors are largely uh, driven by uh, genetic vulnerabilities and uh, less so uh, by uh, environment, child-specific environment. And for the group with low callous and emotional traits, both child-specific, what we call non-shared environmental influences, and also uh, shared environmental influences uh, seem to be of more importance than genetic vulnerability. Now, it's good to remember in this context that these heritability estimates and environmental estimates that we talk about are estimates that uh, refer to explaining individual differences or group differences. They don't refer to a single individual. So they don't mean that a single individual now have 81% risk of developing uh, disruptive behavior disorders. All they mean is that variability in behavior 
in the uh, high CU group and low CU group is to a different degree driven by environmental versus uh, genetic vulnerabilities. Now, to date, we don't really have good molecular genetic data in relation to antisocial behavior, but particularly not in relation to different subtypes. So ourselves and others have speculated that we may uh, be interested in focusing on genes that um, uh, are important for regulating arousal for distressing effect or emotions more generally, or, or genes that are important for promoting affiliation. And certainly there are some candidate gene studies that are suggestive that this might be the case. However, most of the psychiatric uh, genomics has really moved beyond candidate gene studies, so we haven't had any replications here. So I think what we should expect um, is that we see genetic effects uh, that are minuscule and, and uh, are a sum of multiple genes. So these are polygenic effects, and in fact, many other disorders now um, have their polygenic risk scores that have been generated by big uh, genetic consortia data. Sadly, we have not had those consortia uh, for antisocial behavior um, in the same scale. So there is one consortia which I have been part of as, as well, and we have uh, found a, a few hits on a genome-wide uh, association study. However, um, there's nothing really that has uh, been credibly looking at the different uh, subtypes. So there is a long way to go. And an additional challenge here is that uh, we may have genes um, that act uh, come online at different parts of the development. So here's a um, paper we published a, a few years back. Uh, uh, Jean-Baptiste Bingo from UCL was also an author. And we looked at the um, heritability of uh, the initial level of callous and emotional traits. So that was modeled by the intercept. And also the slope of callous on emotional traits over time, all ages 7, 9, 12, and 16. And that is the sort of the developmental trajectory. And both were heritable. The initial uh, um, level of traits was strongly heritable, 0.76. And even the slope showed moderate heritability, 0.4. But there was almost no uh, overlap in the genetic influences that were important for initiating this uh, behavior and, and the ones that were determining its developmental trajectory. So I think this is just to highlight uh, two things. One, that finding the genes will be complicated and, and uh, finding genes for different developmental stages will, will require big samples and uh, developmentally sensitive measurement. And I think we're some way from achieving this. But I think this sort of finding also has uh, some immediate implications when we think about interventions of which uh, algorithms might return to at the end of the talk, which is that both genetic and environmental influences uh, vary across development. And some children may be terribly unlucky in terms of getting both genes and environments that uh, convey initial risk and also have genetic and environmental influences that make it more likely for them to stay in a mal maladaptive trajectory. And Maybe when we're thinking about interventions, we need to think about not just early intervention, which is important, but also that for some vulnerable individuals, we effectively will need inoculation over time rather than think that a single shot intervention is necessarily going to um, fix the problem. In terms of environments, uh, harsh and inconsistent discipline is something that is robustly associated with disruptive behavior disorders, including uh, disruptive behavior with callous and emotional traits. Warm and, and uh, consistent parenting seems to be protective. And there is some data from genetically informative studies uh, that suggests that at least the effect of warm and consistent parenting on callous and emotional traits uh, might be partly mediated by genuinely environmental processes. But it is important to remember that environments don't just happen to us. So um, both children and their caregivers show substantial heritable individual differences in how they process social information, how they reason, how capable they are in regulating their affect. And these restrict the possible social inputs over development and also impact how the development canalizes. So this is the notion of gene environment correlation, which has been demonstrated uh, for uh, disruptive behaviors and for callous and emotional traits. So I think in this context, I'm uh, my sort of final uh, slide before I summarize, 
really relates to how, how I think that the particular neurocognitive endowments, partly driven by genetics, partly driven by uh, environment or gene environment correlation process, how these may impact the socialization of children who have callous and emotional traits and who are at risk of persisting with their disruptive behavior disorders. So if we think about socialization, we often do empathy induction. That really relies on us drawing attention to the impact of child's behavior uh, to someone else. The fact that they've done something and it causes such a person distress. And if we ask the child to empathize with the other, pay attention to the other's distress, the typical reaction is that the child finds this very negative. They get negative arousal to it and they are less likely to do it again because they don't want to hurt the other person. So we use this fact that other, other people's distress is upsetting as a socialization tool via empathy induction. We also use sanctions. So you may have a timeout or you have a, have a privilege revoked when you've done something. And that can work if you're able to make a, co a connection between what you've done and what the outcome is. But if you're not able to make that connection, then the sanctions are less effective. We also ask children to please us. Most children want to please us. Um, but again, if other people's affiliative cues, positive affiliative cues don't have the same effect on us, then that's another socialization tool that is planted. And this is why I think those with high callous and emotional traits are very, very difficult to socialize. So to summarize, uh, callous and emotional traits characterize children with disruptive behavior disorders who lack empathy and typical affiliative response to others. They show blunted affective processing and concomitant neural differences. They appear to have genetic vulnerability to developing disruptive behavior disorders. And our challenge now is to understand how transactional social developmental processes unfold for these children and how we might get in with um, instigating some protective mechanisms that could uh, canalize these children's development differently. And I'm going to hand over to Arguris. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you for submitting. Um, and to the organizers and uh, Professor Follinger for his uh, very um, um, uh, generous introduction. Um, thanks for, for, for linking that so clearly. It would be a very difficult act to follow now, I'm afraid. So um, I hope you won't completely switch off. Um, so I'm going to talk about irritability. Um, I'm, some of you may know I'm very interested in, in, in emotions uh, and mood. Um, and one of the things I've always been wondering about is, is um, how, how, how common, how omnipresent um, some, of those, some of those emotions are. And of course, anger, um, uh, the characteristic, the main characteristic of irritability is, is pretty omnipresent. I was walking the other day through Hyde Park Corner um, and I saw Achilles um, statue, and I was wondering why does Achilles have a statue? He, uh, uh, if you read the Iliad, you know his wrath, his his anger brought. It says in the in the Iliad, um, a, a thousandfold pains upon upon the people. It says even worse things, which I can recite in the original as well. Um, such was the abuse I endured as a child, having to learn these by heart. Um, and then. And then if you read the Bible, you will you will see that there are bits where um, there is anger, which is very bad. Uh, but there's also anger that is divine, that is very important. Um, and and God uh, himself uh, 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 uses it uh, occasionally. Um, you can see anger in everyday life as an interpersonal problem. You can see what the uh, chief staff say, don't take it out on us, right? And, and this is another major characteristic of a lot of anger, which is that it is interpersonal. There's an intentionality related to it. And then it's also a social phenomenon. People, the people, uh, whoever, whoever that is, sections of the public, the whole public are angry about certain things, uh, usually the moral transgressions of others or perceived moral transgressions. And there's quite a lot of that and it can turn quite nasty, but it can also be quite important depending on your uh, standpoint. It is the thing that revolutions are made of. Um, so I've always been fascinated by this. So I decided at some point in my life to study it. Um, <clears throat> and I hope that many of you have or will do will do too. It so happens that, that irritability is also one of the top problems. Some of you who are clinicians will know that we know this, 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 this idea of, of top problems. Um, it's something that in some psychotherapies, like modular psychotherapy, promoted by, um, developed by um, John Weiss and Bruce Chopin, is quite important. So what do people rate as their top problem? And what you can see here when they come to see you 
is that irritability is according to uh, uh, children and young people and their parents, the most important top problem, the top problem compared to all sorts of other things, including depression or anxiety or ADHD or conduct problems as such. This is, you will say, okay, what sample was that? Well, it was a general sample. And if you look into your, into your sample in, in your clinic, for those of you who are clinicians, you'll find that this is probably largely reflected unless you have a very specific referral pathway. Um, so uh, we found it in other samples as well. And of course, uh, it raises a few issues because, well, who are these children? What do we do about them? <clears throat> So irritability in the studies we've done over the years has been shown to be an important antecedent of depression. I can't say whether it is a risk factor as such because we don't have, um, it's, it's very hard obviously to do causal studies with that, but um, it, 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 it occurs in young people before the depressive symptoms arise. Um, and not only that, but it is also genetically associated with depression. So there is a causal, there is a causal link in the sense of a shared risk factor. What we don't quite know is whether being irritable also increases the probability over and above um, uh, your genetics. And that's difficult to the genetic association. That's difficult to disentangle, as some of you will know, because it's hard to partition the variance in top uh, classical twin studies between genetics and gene environment interplay. Longer story, we'll come back to it later on, though. Um, Adolescent irritability is associated with double the risk for suicidality, even up to 30 years uh, uh, later. Uh, there's impairment in educational outcomes and reduced income, a 20-year follow-up. This is from a study we did with uh, uh, some data from um, the Children in the Community study that uh, the late Pat Cohen had kindly provided us with. Um, you will ask me, okay, what is irritability? Irritability refers to, this is how we've defined it so far, um, Inter-individual differences in the proneness to anger, and these may reach a pathological extent, but may also be, and I should add this, I hasten to add this, they can be adaptive, and it depends on the environment. So rather than taking uh, the classical kind of psychiatric, nos nos the nosologist's view of, well, here's disease, here's uh, normalcy, what we should say is that um, it is a phenomenon that can become problematic for, for, for certain people, but can also be um, actually, in certain conditions, quite uh, adaptive. And I'll come back to this example in, at this point in a minute. One of the interesting characteristics about irritability is that it is a negatively valenced emotion, right? So it's people would describe it as dysphoric most of the time. It is negative, right? It's not positive. If you see someone irritable, you won't say, oh, <laughs> what a jolly mood you're in. Um, but it is the only negative emotion I know that is associated with and with approach behaviors, so going and fighting, right, as opposed to kind of leaving the scene, uh, whereas anxiety and depression are mostly withdrawal emotions. So this is a very interesting kind of, it sits somewhere in the middle. As it happens, for those of you interested in nosological research, irritability also straddles the world of the internalizing and the externalizing. It is associated with, uh, with both, which is another very interesting characteristic, probably emanating from, uh, from this. Um, Traditionally, most emphasis has been placed on, on boys with irritability, and it's a positional defined disorder with comorbid, with co-occurring ADHD. So a typical example is, well, here's Jack, seven years old, you know, uh, has always been inattentive, very, very fidgety. And uh, when, when, when his parents ask him to do something, he just, you know, he, he, he just loses it and starts breaking things, right? Um, uh, very, you know, very easy to fly off the handle, very short fuse. This is a very typical example. Um, and it's quite rightly been studied extensively, but we don't know how irritability is affecting girls that much. Do they experience irritability? Do they say so? How impairing is what they experience? Have we been missing out on them? And have we been adhering to social norms um, in, 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 in such a way as to obscure an important part of the research. And we looked at that very recently with my colleague, um, Pablo Vidal Rivas and, and uh, Dr. Georgina Krebs. And we used the Office for National Statistics study from 2017. <clears throat> and there are 20 questions, thankfully, uh, the ONS did that uh, on irritable mood and temper outbursts. I'm going to present in only two things irritable mood and temper outbursts. And this is on about 7,000 young people from 5 to 17 and some uh, adolescents at uh, close to 3,000, between 11 and 17 years. 
So just bear with me. This is the percentage of people who report irritable mood. And this is parent report on children and adolescents. I repeat, this is percentages with standard errors, right? And this is about irritable mood. Parent reported about their children or adolescents. And this is temper outbursts. And we make a distinction for reasons that I can explain later on. So in any case, one is to be kind of grumpy a lot of the time or all of the time. And the other one is to really have, a, have an outburst. The two are correlated, but not perfectly so. They're not coterminous. Um, so the interesting thing is, that indeed boys are much more likely to have both temper outbursts and irritable mood in childhood than the two sexes, because this is sex that the ONS asked here for and rather than gender, converge, seem to converge. Certainly for temper outbursts, seem to come closer together. Now, what happens in adolescence? What we see in adolescence, you can ignore the table here um, for the moment. What you see is that girls in adolescence, when they're asked about it, appear to describe themselves as much more irritable than boys of the same age. Not so much about temper outbursts, but clearly about irritable mood. Now, lots of issues here uh, are boys underreporting um, for various reasons. Uh, are girls overreporting? Could be, um, but it could. And it's very likely to be to be genuine as well. What are the factors that do this? It's important to think about this because. Um, Depression, classical mood problem happens at uh, adolescence, as do anxiety problems. So it seems like irritable mood starts to become much more common in, 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 in girls during that age. And we're not doing much about it, really. And what I want to tell you as well is you could say, well, Algeria, it may be trivial irritability. It may not matter. It may be just one of those things. But it actually isn't. If you look at the impairment, the association between the presence of irritable mood and impairment, you can see that. In adolescence, by self-report, girls show much higher impairment than the irritable uh, boy peers. So it doesn't seem to be trivial in that sense, right? And much above uh, controls, as it were. So it's something important. We have done very little research on this. Um, there is some research in, uh, in, 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 in the field of what we call personality disorders that has possibly some interesting uh, relationships. But clearly, it's something that, that we're missing, and I hope that uh, we will be able to pursue. So let's think a little bit about why people are angry. One of the functions of anger is supposed to be the response to threat, right? Uh, what determines the, and this is another question that I've always had, when people say, well, you know, if you're threatened, you will either engage in a fight or, or you're just uh, gonna, gonna just get up and, and leave. Um, oh, you might freeze as well, but generally fight flight, right? Well, okay, um, how, 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 um, how, what determines that? Like, how do we know why this is? So it is a very interesting question. And uh, with one of my postdocs at the, uh, at the NIH, we, we said, okay, what happens when you're presented with a threat? And we thought that it might be environmental affordances, that something that happens in the environment determines whether for one and the same stimulus you express anger or fear. So what we did is we prepared videos with the kind of threatening scenes. And then for the very same stimulus, you could either have a non-weapon affordance, um, so an implement that you could use like a, you know, a, a pen, or something that, that is actually uh, a weapon affordance that where you could do something to, to, to avert uh, the threat and fight it, as it were. So this is the structure of the of the trial. And then we um, we you'd have time to make a decision and say whether you would fight or escape. And then you'd have to rate how you felt, how fearful do you feel, how angry. And one of the interesting findings was, well, perhaps not so surprising, was that when it came to the probability of fighting, it was much higher for the same stimulus uh, if you had a weapon. You were much more likely to say, okay, I'm going to fight whatever, the zombies, whatever it was, if you give me, um, if, you, if, if I have a weapon as opposed to a pen. But um, the, 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 the fascinating thing is that it is also when people are more angry. So this is the weapon condition versus the non-weapon condition. Remember, it's a within individual, same stimulus type design, right? Um, 
This is the anger rating on the y-axis, and the two different colors code for whether you decided to fight or to escape. So if you decide to fight and you're in the weapon condition, you're much more likely to display anger, to feel anger, to say that you're angry, which is quite interesting. So for one of the same stimulus, the environmental affordance makes a difference. So the effect of a stimulus and emotion is causally impacted upon by environmental affordance, it seems. In circumstances that favor fighting, anger is more likely expressed, whereas in those that favor escaping, fear is more likely to be expressed. Um, this led us to the to, to what I say, I said the thing at the beginning, you're angry because you can afford to be angry. This is some important implications. People say, oh, I just lost it and I beat up my spouse or whatever, whatever it is. Um, it's not a good defense on a number of levels, but 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 it also seems that you do this because you had made a calculation at that point that you can afford to do it. If there was someone else there who would, you know, I don't know, punch back or something like that, you might not do it. So we are working on this at the moment. It's in preparation, this particular manuscript, and we're doing some more research. And I think it is it is actually quite uh, quite a fascinating um, uh, um, uh, area for people to go down uh, down down to. Um, so the other thing that we were interested in is um, anger is thought to have the role of a signal to ourselves. This is kind of standard evolutionary theory. What happens when we have nothing to do? How does anticipation of reward play into it? And do we represent alternative environments? So we, what we did was we, we had people, and I'm, I'm saying anger here, it is actually kind of a degree of dysphoria of feeling annoyed, not, not, feeling, not feeling happy uh, about things. When we had people look, stare at the screen, we had people look at a cross. This was the result of other mood experiments that we were doing at the time. So we thought, well, everyone's using staring at a cross as a neutral stimulus. That's what you do in um, resting state research. So here we go. Let's use it as a, as, a, as a neutral stimulus and see what happens to mood, self-rated mood from moment to moment. And what we found uh, was that when you do this, when you ask people to do this, their mood declines. They, they become dysphoric over time. And quite substantially, so with an effect size of close to 0.6 over nine minutes, which is quite a lot, actually. Um, this raises all sorts of issues about resting state research. It raises issues about um, experiments that have longer resting state periods in between. So especially if you want to draw inferences about people's, uh, people's emotions uh, at, that, at that point. So we call this phenomenon mood drift over time. And it seems that when you have to wait, you're just unhappy about it. Uh, now, the other thing that we found was, and I'm not gonna bore you with the details of this, is the main thing is that we can, we can model in a very simple way for the moment, this decline of mood over time with a linear term, just a linear decline. It's very, it's probably unrealistic, but as you saw, there is probably, um, an, you know, an exponential kind of a saturating decline in any case. Um, so, but it doesn't matter. Um, the, the important point here is that it is associated with um, uh, reward sensitivity. So the more sensitive people are to reward, the more likely they are to experience this dysphoria. So we have made some predictions on the basis of that, that people with uh, depression are less likely to be uh, uh, responsive to that. that people with uh, conditions that often co-occur with hypersensitivity to rewards, such as some people with ADHD, uh, may show a much stronger uh, um, uh, 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 decline in, 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 in mood. And we found some initial evidence with that when we looked at life happiness in those people uh, and found that the slope of the decline was flatter for them compared to those uh, who were generally described themselves as being happy. Um, we are working on a model at the moment uh, with uh, Isabel Riddler, my um, current, uh, one of my current postdocs, about how um, opportunity cost, how the representation of alternative counterfactual uh, situations might influence how you uh, represent time and the passage of time and how this may impact on regulation of, uh, of mood. So, I think this is interesting because it links together um, time with mood. And we have this, I have this wild theory, I, which I, I don't even know if it's a theory or, or just a, a fantasy at, at this stage, because I don't know whether I can test it properly, but be very open to people's opinions, is that uh, felt, not physical, but felt time 
is is a phenomenon related to what we describe here to um, uh, 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 mood drift mood drift over time, which would be quite fascinating actually, and emanates from the representation of alternatives of alternative possibilities. You heard from Professor Vidding that mood that well that we interact with our environments. This is particularly true about mood, and it's a very surprising phenomenon that in psychopathology people don't think about it at all. Um, they don't talk about those interactive uh, phenomena um, and treat mood in a very ancient way, in a very romantic way, I hasten to add. It's not just ancient, which is like, it's a passion. I was just befallen by, replace the word love with the word depression, right? It's a passion. It happens to you. You are passive. But it's not necessarily like this for a number of reasons. And we have a whole kind of area of research devoted to this. But the point here is that when you have a mood, very often you will interact with your environment, particularly when you externalize it in that way, as you do with anger. So anger inter mood interacts with the environment. We know this from children's tantrums that influence parental uh, 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 responses. Um, uh, uh, parents are more likely to give in to the children's demands if their children are displaying tantrums. There's uh, the phenomenon of gene environment correlation that you heard about already, people scoring high on neuroticism are more likely to experience negative life events, for example. Children of biological mothers with psychopathology are more likely to evoke negative adoptive maternal reactions. You heard about that already. There's the issue of parental accommodation in, 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 in OCD. Again, um, uh, something where parents are coerced by the behavior of the child, as it were, to, to do certain things. So um, no mood, no emotion. Is innocent or nearly none, I don't know. Um, there's a fascinating study um, that uh, was published in, in 2000, in 2006. I thought it was it was earlier than that. But anyway, I, I yeah, published online in 2000. This was from the early 80s, um, which is about the potential importance of um, of of having a difficult temperament, of, of being of, of the importance of being angry. Um, and they were describing this is uh, about what happened in uh, when 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 uh, people in in, in Africa uh, faced a, a terrible shortage uh, of water and, and and people were dying. And there's some indication that uh, amongst the the Maasai people in East Africa, that children with difficult temperaments had a higher probability to survive than those with easy temperament. It's not a it's it's a statistically challenged study for obvious reasons. It's kind of a natural experiment. There are other examples about how characteristics of of a child that we would generally consider to be problematic and can be quite adaptive in certain perhaps extreme environments. And of course, you know this this would tally with with uh, classical evolutionary theory. Um, it is important to remember this interaction with the environment, and I'm coming to a close in a, in a minute. <clears throat> Because what we call coercive, mutually coercive cycles, when a child makes a demand, and I'm just using the parent-child uh, uh, thing here, but for example here, I could talk very easily about couples, I could talk about friends, I could talk about all sorts of relationships. When a child makes a demand, those of you who have children, have observed children, very, very much worth doing, actually. Piaget did it with his own child and came to great conclusions. I, I haven't yet mastered that art, but I'm, I'm working on it. My children are uh, grow, are a bit older now, so I'm not sure. I probably missed the uh, missed the train there. Um, but but it is quite interesting to see that you know there is at the late time in the evening you observe a child. Child makes a demand. Quite tired. You're tired. Say no. The child you refuse. The child kind of escalates. Will 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 often escalate. Not all children will do it in the, in the, in the same to the same degree. But everyone, all of us, will, will have a tendency to say, no, I want to insist on what I asked you to do. Um, this can lead to a cycle because, of course, one of the things that you might do as a child person is to throw a fit, right, to, to, to have a wobbly, say, you know, start crying, start throwing things, even just pulling a face that could affect your parent. Remember, we as parents or we as other people, you know, we have devices to decode others' emotions. And of course, we become very distressed when our children or our other, other fellow human beings become distressed. Might then give in. Now, what happens if you give in? We well, don't need to be a great behavioral psychologist to realize that 
um, this giving in creates at least two types of reinforcement, right? Or reinforcement in two people. Your own behavior, you said, okay, take the iPad and go and watch well, and that will give you some quiet. And of course, for the child knows, okay, well, <laughs> that worked very well. That's quite good. So I'm simplifying things, but you will often observe that. And, and this is what people would call a reinforcement of certain behavior. Interestingly, <clears throat> research, uh, particularly mechanistic research, has largely neglected this transactional element. Uh, and it's very surprising because parent management training, which is all about social learning principles and the importance of praise and positive interactions and setting boundaries and not giving in and uh, uh, is, is one of the most efficacious, is the most efficacious and effective uh, um, uh, 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 intervention. Uh, psychological intervention for externalizing behavior problems, for disruptive behavior problems in, in, in young people. Um, now, this is um, a causal lever, as, as, as we would say with, uh, with, uh, with SE. It means that if that's the case, if parent management training um, is, is effective, then uh, why don't we study its mechanisms in detail? Can we demonstrate experimentally that it is really the reinforcement mechanisms are actually active ingredient. It could be something else, and we should always entertain that possibility. It could just be that you know you're just nice, or you just uh, you know for the first time you attended to certain things and not others. It, it could be all sorts of things. So we should look at that. Can we model reinforcement learning computationally? Can we use multi-agent reinforcement learning to, for example, to do this? So um, non-station reinforcement learning where um, your position changes as the other person change their, uh, change their, uh, changes their position. Um, and we are trying to collaborate with uh, engineers in, at UCL at the moment, with the engineering department uh, who are working with such models. And of course, can we maximize the effects of interventions by manipulating this active ingredient, which is a very important point. So we're hoping that some funder one day will, 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 ask, will ask about uh, disruptive behavior disorders and we can tell them, yes, there's a big gap and you know, here's how to fill it. Um, there's currently no equivalent intervention such, such as parent management training in adolescence. There's some CBT that may work, but in for some people. Uh, and it's again surprising that we haven't looked into the transactional elements uh, re relating to anger and irritability. How do we understand and represent others? These are very fundamental questions. And how we how is it that how we are represented by others in others affects us? And what do life history and sense of self? Uh, what role do they play? Um, in this, how you are, what do you expect of others, and who you expect to be in the eyes of others. Um, there's, of course, the very interesting and important concepts of mentalization that have recently been introduced also in, in systemic practice. And there is a great book that I highly recommend by um, um, uh, Aya uh, Asen and, and Professor Peter Fonagy. And uh, it's, it's about that. And it'd be very interesting to try to take these concepts uh, and see how they apply to anger and irritability, and uh, maybe the chair can uh, comment on that. Could they be uh, could they be useful, for example, in, uh, in 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 irritability? Should we just should we say this? Maybe do you yeah, want to finish yeah. on this? Yeah. So I think uh, hopefully our our sort of joint talk has convinced you that uh, we think of brain not just as a receiver but also a creator of environments, so and that may happen differently depending on your level of CU traits or irritability. But it's certainly something that we ought to work harder to understand. And both genetic and environmental factors calibrate how the brain processes information and have an impact on socialization and social interactions. So we really need to study this. And I think if we just can get the money, we are at an exciting juncture of research into uh, DBDs. We need new approaches that go beyond cross-sectional neurocognitive research or non-mechanistic longitudinal studies. And given the complexities of how behaviors come about, I think what might be most fruitful in the first instance is really trying to find these causality levers of protective mechanisms that we might be able to put in place. And I think to do this work, we need more advocacy. And I think that's one of the reasons why the DBDs have been traditionally the sort of the poor cousin. They are not uh, a constellation of behaviors that elicit a lot of sympathy on other people. Um, they don't make a good poster po boy for sort of the mental health disorders. And often the families uh, who have children with disruptive behavior disorders have all sorts of difficulties in their lives, which make them less able to advocate for their children. But these children are vulnerable. We think they deserve a chance. And um, there is a great need to sort of change this, um, this lack of research and lack of um, funding uh, in this area. 
And I think we both want to, because this is a joint talk, we haven't included a typical thank you slide, but I think we want to both uh, finish by really thanking our teams and uh, part um, uh, in the research studies, all the colleagues at UCL and other places and, and funders for our research. So I just want to acknowledge that. Quite, yes, quite, quite, can't quite, do quite. this research on your own. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. And, and thank you so much, guys. That that was absolutely brilliant. Um, it's a great talk, subject matter of enormous interest to all of us uh, who have children and who uh, have uh, tried to deal with temper tantrums. I remember the worst temper tantrum my son ever had was at the age, I think about four after I gave a lecture on early years interventions in Finland, as it happened, I say, and uh, after when we made our way to the airport with my family, uh, with many of the people at the uh, uh, large conference still there uh, around us, uh, my son had the worst temper tantrum I have ever seen with many of the audience watching me to see how I intervened. And of course, I was totally paralyzed uh, and the uh, uh, rather uh, <laughs> Uh, interesting uh, sequence of events that Algeria has just identified took place absolutely with me caving in totally uh, and uh, demonstrating the worst uh, uh, possible. But I think the uh, important thing that I should point out is that parenting um, uh, management training is actually recommended in ev almost every single um, nice guidance there is about children's disorders. So uh, parenting uh, works with ADHD and uh, parenting management training works uh, uh, with uh, also uh, with anxiety disorders uh, uh, and it's there. Um, so it's the reinforcement environment that uh, uh, you uh, drew attention to, I think is, is, is critical. I don't want to hold, um, uh, the uh, attention to many, many questions, uh, but I want just want you to address one issue, both of you, that there is a massive um, association between uh, the kind of behaviors that you're talking about and socioeconomic status, deprivation, and so on. Uh, I can't let you off the hook without asking you uh, how you account for that within uh, the systems that uh, you have identified? Is it just because uh, there is uh, the butterfly uh, wings that start a sequence uh, that end up in a, a, a difficult place? Or does that uh, uh, interact with uh, some of the mechanisms that uh, you have identified? I can start and I can hand over to Argus. I think the we don't fully know why that happens. I think that one of the, I mean, the causality there I think is tricky to show. So of course, if you if you um, if your behavior is such that you can't keep engaged in education, you can't hold down uh, employment because you kind of violate so societal norms. Your ability to earn money and earn a good living is obviously diminished. And you, there are probably intergenerational phenomena, which is partly due to, you know, genetic vulnerabilities that place you into that sort of trajectory, but also partly due to this is where you grew up in here, here was your starting point. So over time, you know, you have both environmental and, and genetic vulnerabilities accumulating in families. Now, of course, we also know that there are a number of people who come from, uh, uh, you know, lower socioeconomic backgrounds who are not, in fact, majority are not disruptive. So, you know, I, I don't think it it can sort of explain, but it certainly doesn't help. And of course, um, I think one thing that is is sort of very noticeable, and I think I, I come back to this advocacy point again, you know, I think one of the reasons why we get a lot of funding for autism research, for uh, anxiety, depression, eating disorders, is that these are conditions uh, that, um, you know, occur a lot in middle class families who have the kind of the resources to advocate for these sorts of conditions, whereas here we have often multiple problems accumulating in families. 
and and socioeconomic lower socioeconomic status goes with that and families not having the bandwidth or always the ability to to advocate so uh, I, I, that's a slightly waffly answer but uh, I, I don't have much to add except to say that that sometimes anger is um, is of course warranted yeah and if it weren't for uh, for anger there wouldn't have been changes in society so it's quite interesting and quite important often to that's be right. uh, to be angry it's just that you don't want the wrong people to be angry because uh, it can be it can be trouble but it is important and i think this isn't being increasingly recognized uh, 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 as 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 such it's very interesting to look at the link not just with absolute say levels of poverty but with inequality because it is this representation of the alternative that may be quite important here and 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 this comparison so I th i'm i'm hoping that we will be able to do research to look at inequalities and 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 these phenomena where again the phenomenon may be quite justified actually so just just so of putting... course you also have these behaviors also occurring in not just lower socioeconomic oh, yeah. and also in countries like finland where you have lower inequalities so so it's uh yeah, yeah. good to, yeah, to compare yeah i agree There's, yeah thank you thanks very much for that can i encourage people to uh put their hands up uh and ask questions if, uh, uh, they can wish i to... say something sorry yeah uh, there are a few questions in the chat. Uh, uh, okay, uh, there, there are indeed a few questions in the chat, and uh, uh, I was going to turn to those right I'm away sorry, really sorry. after I've encouraged people to put their hands up. Uh, but that, that is that is perfectly all right. So um, uh, can I just uh, taking from from the chat um, uh, a very challenging question. Uh, to you from, I think, Professor Thompson, uh, Ajibis, could the decline uh, in mood be related to irritation at repeated responding to the question rather than waiting per se? Yeah, oh gosh, yeah, absolutely. This was one of the things we considered and, and I can uh, send you the paper. We, we did whatever we could to address that. So we had, initially we had, let's ask them every, I can't remember, 30 seconds. Then we say, well, 30 seconds is perhaps too often and maybe it comes from that. Then we had it every minute, then every two minutes. And then we ended up, I think, with just one at the beginning and one at the end. And the finding was pretty much the same. So the number of times you asked them doesn't didn't play a role uh, in terms of the 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 the, the slope you, you you got out of it. We also used various different ways in, in having them rated, like enter a number, slider, all sorts of things. So I don't think it is an artifact because of that, but but thank you. It's a great question indeed. Yeah. I mean, on that, Ajir is. I was quite curious that because uh, as he mentioned that uh, uh, callous and emotional states are, are very strongly associated with uh, a uh, decreased uh, sensitivity to rewards and that what you find is that uh, the more sensitive to rewards people are, the more than mood declines. And yet my experience of callous and emotional people is that the they're not very tolerant of uh, staring no, no, so at they're not, they are not not uh, they are actually very sensitive to rewards and reward driven they are not just very good at making a connection between what they've done and the outcome so they have difficulties in reinforcement learning but their motivation by reinforcement is 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 definitely there and, and strong uh, yeah. a very helpful clarification thanks very much um uh, uh, another question um uh, in relation to um, uh, the gender difference, um, uh, is it um, true that uh, girls, young women may mask their irritability more because of the social norm? So the parents observation of that is an underestimate. How do you think the informants and uh, uh, the self-report uh, Correspond to each other. Yeah, yeah. No, I think this is a this is quite a quite a possible explanation. Actually, there is there is a whole area of research outside of uh, mainstream psychology and psychiatry. It's mainly in sociology um, um, about uh, emotional labor. People may have heard about this this concept um, um, and about how people kind of in different strands of society. Um, particular jobs or different genders um, uh, will will be expected to regulate their emotions differently, uh, display them differently, and therefore also have to uh, work harder on regulating certain emotions. So it is quite possible that this is a phenomenon here. 
disentangling that from, you know, boys just not being very good at reporting on their emotions, for example, which, you know, is quite a plausible thing as well, uh, in, in many ways, is, is, is a hard one, but there are ways, and it is a very interesting, it is a very interesting uh, uh, question. In I wonder to what degree this has to do with the affordances as well. Yeah. Because you were talking about affordances in relation to sort of very overt physical aggression, where, you know, obviously you can afford to be less physically aggressive if you're smaller, and as a rule, females are smaller. But I'm wondering to what extent it's about social affordances as True. well. So if you're a female, there is a higher social cost to you being angry mm -hmm. than if you're a male. Yeah, I, 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 that and I think that you, could, that you could test experimentally. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. I think this is a this is a very plausible. This is a very plausible explanation. Now, there is the issue, though, that there is also sadness is more often expressed by by or experienced uh, by by girls at that age and anxiety, too. So we need to take that take that into account and look at it in, in total. Why that is, you know, it could and it could just be. We mustn't forget the the very likely thing that it would just be. It could just be the truth that these could be the true scores are just different, right, and not just an expression of biased reporting of some sort or other. There is a question in the chat relating to this as well by Simone Smith, where she was talking about the uh, higher possible cost to females about this as well, and I do wonder whether this also may be partly contributing to the imbalance in the degree of internalizing versus externalizing in adolescence between boys and girls. Mm -hmm. Could be, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah can I just, uh, maybe the last question, but it's a really important one that uh, Simon uh, also raises, which is, could we change the narrative and rename disruptive to a word that uh, would not put the emphasis so much on the child who's guilty, uh, um, who is the antagonist, uh, uh, can we? Is it? Can we do it? Can can we change the discourse slightly to change the funding arrangements amongst other things? <laughs> I think it's a I think it's a tricky one because we do need agreed language in order to know that we're looking at the same thing. And there are particular instruments that have been developed and particular diagnostic protocols and umbrellas. I personally wouldn't have a problem with the name changing if the um, APA uh, in their diagnostic manual would, <laughs> would be happy to, to do that. Interestingly, I, to, I sort of viewed the disruptive behavior more just as a, okay, here's, here's behavior that is difficult. And I don't think there's any arguing that the behavior is difficult. I don't view it as this is the child's fault. The behavior is an outward manifestation of something's not quite right in the ecosystem. Child is finding something difficult. The ecosystem hasn't been able to help them. So it's interesting that we, we also clearly view it different because I, I don't, I don't read it and read that the child is an antagonist. I read it that there is a set of problems that is actually hampering, um, you know, the progress of the child. And I don't think that, you know, I often get people asking about stigmatizing. And I, I sort of have a little bit of a low degree of patience for it because these children stigmatize themselves quite effectively by the way they behave. So I think we should perhaps argue less about that and 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 just advocate for these children more because they are clearly in distress. They're not having the best time or they're causing other people distress, perhaps in the case of the CU kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we would agree with Yeah. Well, uh, I think we're coming quite close to the, because to the end. Uh, and I think it uh, uh, just remains for me to thank you along with many, many other people on the chat uh, for a couple of uh, great talks. Uh, that are overlapping in content, but also quite uh, separate. I think it's a uh, 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 brilliant uh, reminder for us that what is perhaps most troubling for teachers and most of those of us that work with uh, children, young people, uh, gets the least attention uh, from researchers, perhaps, and uh, Thank you so much, both of you, for trying to reverse the trend uh, and uh, your scientific and, and uh, intellectual contributions are, are really, really appreciated by all of us. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you. Peter. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks everyone thank for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Joy. Yeah. Joy